skies will be filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own Army Air Forces, the best planes ever built, 65,000 planes this year. And by the time you finish your training, America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Outing. I'm one of the docents here at the museum. And so today we're going to talk about the 345th Bomb Group, the Air Apaches. So really quick, we're going to talk about the formation of the group. We'll talk about the theater of operations they were going to go into. We'll talk about their uh, combat operations. That'll be the bulk of the presentation. And then we'll talk a little bit about their combat record to sum up the uh, presentation. All right, so we'll talk about formation first. So the group was formed in November of 1942. They were at Columbia Army Air Base in South Carolina. Uh, there were four squadrons in the group. The 498th, the uh, Falcons. The 499th, the Bats Out of Hell. You have the, five, the 500th, which was the Rough Raiders. And then you have the 501st, the Black Panthers. So they were the four squadrons, the four flying squadrons that comprised the 345th Bomb Group. Now the bomb group itself did not have a name other than the 345th Bomb Group. And they, they were in that status until March of 1944. In 1944, they had a contest to decide what's the group going to be called. And the contest winner, the name he submitted, was the Treetop Terrors. And that was a byproduct of the tactics they were using at the time. Uh, in August of 1944, the crews decided, or the group decided, that they did not like that name. They didn't have a good ring to it. And so they had another contest, and they came up with the Air Apaches. And that was the name that would stick with them and has become their legacy. Uh, the two logos you see here, the logo on the left, that's the original logo that they had. Uh, one of the group members actually designed it, and uh, they started painting it on the tails of the airplane. Uh, about six months later, a new guy came into the group. Uh, he had a lot of graphics uh, background did a lot of advertising type stuff, and he cleaned the logo up, and that's the logo on the right, and that's the logo that Bill's got painted on the museum's B-25, uh, and that is, that is what people associate with the Air Apaches. Um, and they picked the name because of the, the warrior tradition of the Apache tribe, and that was their motivation for picking that name, and it does come off the tongue a lot better than treetop terrors. All right, so now we're going to talk about them deploying. So when the group was in South Carolina, they then transitioned to Georgia, and they got issued cold weather gear, and the airplanes were equipped to fly in cold weather. So what would your assumption be? Where do you guys think they were going to go? Alaska, Europe, right? They thought they were going to Europe. Well, of course, the Army Air Force said, nah, we're going to send you to the Pacific. And so off they went. So as you guys look at the map of the United States, you see that dashed black line. That is the route that the ground echelon took. That's their train trip. Uh, and then the air crews flew the solid black line. They got to San Francisco, and then they went off to the Pacific. The ground crew on a ship, on that, still on that dashed line, and then the flight crews flew Hawaii down to Christmas Island, and then they had to, two routes they took. That was just for logistics. They didn't have enough ramp space at all the airfields to handle 48 airplanes. There was 12 airplanes per squadron, so the 48 airplanes. And then they ended up in Australia and eventually in Port Moresby. All right, now we'll talk about the theater of operations. So this map shows the entire area they operated in. That red band highlights that area they were in. So initially, when they got to Australia, they were in Townsville. It's on the eastern coast of the country. And that was really their staging base. Uh, that was their depot where they would do airplane modifications, and the crews would go back there for leave. That was that, what that area was for. Uh, they're now gonna, then they were going to go up to New Guinea. So when you look at this map, and you have to remember that the Japanese held about half of New Guinea. So why would New Guinea be important? Why does anybody think it would be important to have New Guinea at this point in the war? So summer of 1942. So primarily it was to use it as a launch base to attack and take Australia. That was really the Japanese. That was one of the things they were targeting. So there, there were some natural resources there, but primarily it was a staging base to get to Australia. So... The 345th operated out of three bases in New Guinea. They started in Port Moresby, then they moved to uh, Dobadura, and then Nadzab. After that, they moved to the island of Biak, which is just off the coast of New Guinea. 
Then they went to the Philippines. At first, they operated out of a Tacloban Air Base. That was on the island of Leyte, so central Philippines. And then they went to Luzon, and that was going to be their final two bases in the Philippines. They were at San Marcelino and then Clark Field. And then their final operational base was Aishima. That is a small island about 10 miles west of Okinawa, so they were within 300 miles or 350 miles of the southern coast of Japan, and that would be their final operational area. All right, so the early days of the 5th Air Force is which they were going to be assigned to. The uh, 5th Air Force, uh, according to General Kenny, who took over command of the, Air, the 5th Air Force in August of 1942, things were chaotic. Uh, he came into a situation where there was poor leadership, they were undermanned, they, were not having good, they did not have good equipment, they had low sortie rates and extremely low morale. So General Kenny's hands were full when he showed up in Australia in August of 1942. What he set out to do was change the leadership problem right away. And so he, first thing he did is he downsized his headquarters and he moved it closer to the fight. So he had better, better feel for what was going on, particularly in, particularly in New Guinea. Uh, he started working on getting them better aircraft. When he got there, their primary fighters were P-39s and P-40s. They were pretty much outmatched by the Japanese. Uh, he was notorious for going to Washington, D.C. and bribing people to get P-38s to come to 5th Air Force. Uh, fortunately for him, 8th Air Force had gotten to the point where they didn't really want them. They were taking them because they had them, but he really liked the P-38 and the crews like flying it. Uh, other things that he did is he moved all the logistics supplies, as many as he could, to the front. So rather than having all of these supplies they needed to fix airplanes in Australia, he moved them to New Guinea. Now they were able to fix the airplanes on site, and then they were able to fight better. Uh, they, now, they, one good thing that he did have is he had the B-25s, B-26s, and the A-20s. And these were going to be the medium bombers, and they were very effective airplanes. He just didn't have enough of them, so he had to go fight for more airplanes. As a result of these changes that he started to make, and, the and I forgot the most important one, is he put in people that could lead, they could do things. And that was probably the biggest thing he did, is he put capable people into leadership roles. Results, well, they had more effective sorties, they increased their sortie rate, and they were more effective when they went to fight. Uh, that helped them supply General MacArthur's troops better, so a big thing was moving General MacArthur's troops around and getting them the supplies they needed. And so now they were more effective, so General MacArthur could go on the offensive. And I love this quote from General MacArthur. He says, oh, George, is, George was born 300 years too late. He's a natural-born pirate. And that resonated with MacArthur. MacArthur wanted people to get things done, and General Kenny could, was very capable of doing that. All right, now we're going to get into the combat operations. So hopefully I put enough maps in here to help you figure out where we're talking about. All right, so the first one we've got, this is New Guinea. And their first operations were out of Port Moresby. So on the western side of the, the, the southern peninsula there, uh, they would then operate out of Dobadura, and finally Nadzab on the island of New Guinea. And those other locations on there we'll talk about, those are different areas that they hit during the war. I do want to point out really quick Finch Haven. So when you guys see that, that is the airfield that the museum's P-38 came from. So White 33 came from that location. So just to give you some idea of where that airplane was at. All right, so we'll talk about Port Moresby first, operations out of there. They were going to attack Salamaua. So that was one, an airfield and an area that the Australians and the uh, U.S. Army ground forces were starting to attack. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about the Owen Stanley mountain range. Uh, there's a lot of factors in warfare that affect how you fight, and the mountains were part of the problem that they had to deal with. So this is a terrain map, and inside that red box is the mountain peaks. Now keep in mind, Port Moresby is over on the left underneath the arrow. That arrow, uh, Port Moresby is very close to sea level, probably is sea level. And when you look at the Owen Stanley mountain range, there's peaks that range between 10 and 13,000 feet. So this isn't like being here in Colorado Springs where we're at you know, 6,000 odd feet in elevation and Pikes Peak is a little over 14,000 feet. You're actually gonna have to climb 10 to 13,000 feet to get over the mountains. It takes a lot of fuel, a lot of time, and it's dangerous. Flying in the mountains is not as safe as flying over level land. So their initial operations were supporting the 3rd Australian Division and the U.S. forces eventually. Uh, mostly it was airdrops at first. So about the first half of June, that's what they were doing. So June of 1943, they were doing resupply missions for the Australian troops. 
Unfortunately, in this time frame, this is when their first combat casualty occurred, and it was due to the mountains and weather. Uh, one of their crews had flown into the clouds, and then they impacted the, a mountain in the Owen Stanley Range. Uh, they did start bombing at the end of June of 1942, or 1943, and that would continue um, for, the next, for the next almost two years. All right, so their bombing tactics. When they first went into theater, they were using medium bombing tactics. So they would bomb from three to 10,000 feet of altitude, uh, and they would have to fly precise air speeds, precise headings, and this was what, how they were gonna drop their bombs. Uh, it did not work as well as they wanted to. It was not uncommon for Fifth Air Force crews, including the 345th Bomb Group, to experience less than 50% of their bombs hitting the target they were intending from those altitudes. So General Kinney knew that they had to make some changes. And they came up with some new tactics. Um, starting in March of 1944, they were effectively using these as their primary tactics. Uh, this is while the, the Air Apaches were on their way to the theater, uh, and they did not start them right away. They had to get their aircraft modified to go execute these tactics. That's why they were starting with that medium bombing altitude at first. Uh, the person that came up was the instigator of a lot of these tactics was a gentleman by the name of Pappy Gunn. So Pappy Gunn had, was a retired uh, Navy petty officer who had been a pilot in the U.S. Navy. He was living in Australia. The war starts. He is running an airline as the war started. He then went into the Army Air Force. They made him a, a pilot. He was now a captain in the Army Air Force, so in 03. And he uh, was flying missions back and forth between Australia and the Philippines. He got held back in Australia when the Philippines was about to fall. Unfortunately for him, his family was in the Philippines still, and they spent from February roughly of 1942 through February of 1945 in a Japanese internment camp. But Pappy Gunn continued to fly with the Army Air Force, and he started to tinker with the airplanes. He was a mechanic by trade, and he started mounting extra machine guns in the nose of bombers and started flying low level and was having a lot of success with this, these tactics. General Kinney saw this, heard about it, and decided to go check it out. And what did he do? Using his concept of people that are capable, I'm going to promote him. He promoted him to major, and he actually brought him onto the headquarters staff. And now he became part of that tactical planning, and he came up with the tactics that the 345th was going to end up using in the war. All right, now there is a danger to flying low level, and there's a lot of them. Uh, you could... Obviously, you don't have a lot of altitude to work with, so if you have a problem on your airplane, you can't really get away from the problem at times. Uh, but for a combat perspective, you've got to worry about the people behind you. If they're too close to you, they can shoot at you. Uh, if you're dropping bombs, and they would use parafragmentation bombs, and I'll show you pictures of those later, but this picture's got a couple of them that are going off. Those bombs slowed down the descent, or the parachute slowed down the bomb's descent to the point that you could get away so you didn't take shrapnel in your airplane. But another problem was if you got too close to the guys in front of you that were dropping bombs, and I don't know how well you can see it, but inside are the three arrows, those are bombs that have just been deployed from another B-25. Their parachutes haven't really opened up fully yet. And then inside the red circle is a B-25 that was too close and at the same altitude as the bombs, so that crew is pulling up, and you can see see the vapor coming off the wings. Uh, this was actually in Indochina later in the war, but I think you guys get the point. This was dangerous business that they were doing. All right, talk about a couple bomb types they used. Uh, the parafragmentation bombs, I already kind of alluded to it. Uh, they would generally use uh, something like a three bomb cluster. There were three 23-pound bombs in this cluster that were connected to a parachute. They would put a parachute on 100 or 250 pound bombs. That was about as big as they would go with the parachutes on those bombs. And they would drop out, and like I said, that parachute slows down the descent of the bomb just enough that uh, the crew is not going to take shrapnel in the backside of the airplane. But it does create that other problem of if you're too close, you could take shrapnel from somebody else's bombs. So timing was incredibly important for these guys. And generally when they came in, when they did a wave, it was waves of waves of airplanes separated by one minute. That was enough time to let the bombs fall and not impact the airplanes behind you. The other kind of bomb they used was white phosphorus. So white phosphorus bomb, when it blows up and they would have it detonate in the air, uh, when the phosphorus is exposed to the air, it starts burning and it burns very hot and as it falls it lands on things and it will burn whatever it lands on. So metal, structures, um, they would use it against personnel and these were very dangerous but very effective. 
Uh, the crews like to call these Kenny's cocktails. So in honor of General Kenny, because he liked to use these bombs when he had them. And they did do a lot of damage. All right, let's talk about what they were flying when they got into theater. So these are the, this is what they came into theater with, the B-25 variant. So it has a glass nose like the museum's B-25 does, but it only had one machine gun in the nose. It also had a ventral or belly turret. Uh, that was problematic. They did take them out in later models of the B-25. It just wasn't worth putting in for all the problems it created. The dorsal or top turret was at the trailing edge of the wing and it had a small tail turret. All right, so now we get into the modified B-25s. So Pappy Gunn had come up with this modification line and they would pull B-25s off the line, send them back to Australia, and they would modify them. So in August of 1943, after about a month and a half of combat operations using these medium altitude tactics, the Air Apaches went back and they started, started getting their airplanes modified. They made three modifications to the airplane. Modification number one is on the nose. They put a solid nose on there, or mostly solid nose, and there's four 50 caliber machine guns in the nose. There was a little bit of glass in some of the noses. Uh, the second modification is they put a blister on either side of the cockpit and those each held two 50 caliber machine guns. So now they have eight, four, eight 50 caliber machine guns on the front of the airplane and they can start strafing with that. The third modification they did is they took out that ventral turret and they replaced it with an automatic camera that would take a lot of pictures. So a lot of the pictures you're going to see today are pictures that came out of that, that belly turret or that belly camera. And they would use that for battle damage assessment. So they could watch and see where bombs were falling and they could make estimates and claims on uh, structures or uh, vessels or aircraft destroyed. Okay, so now we're going to get into the low-level operations, and this is pretty much what they did through the end of the war. So again, out of Port Moresby, and they were going to attack, go back one, they were going to attack WIWAC, which is up on the northern coast. This was a major Japanese base, and the, those attacks actually started in August of 1943 when the 345th was getting its airplanes modified. The uh, Fifth Air Force had successfully attacked it in August. They destroyed most of the aircraft and a lot of the structure that was there. Uh, by the end of September of 1943, the Japanese had resupplied the base and it needed to be dealt with again. So the 345th participated in that raid. And the two pictures you see here, the picture on the left, is a Japanese Zero that's about to get hit by parafragmentation bombs and it would be destroyed. And then the picture on the right, uh, in the center, there's a large number of Japanese airplanes, including some Betty bombers, that are lined up on, along the runway. And you can see the B-25s have already been through. They've dropped a lot of bombs. And the ones that you see in the picture have already dropped their parafragmentation bombs, and they're starting to fly away from the area, and they would decimate those airplanes. So these tactics were very effective. After this September of 1943 attack, WIWAC became really not a much of a base for the Japanese. Fifth Air Force would revisit occasionally. That was more to just keep it from getting built back up, but they had eliminated the threat of WIWAC. So next they moved to the base at Dobadura, and they would fly out of this base for about a year, and this would be some of their more, most significant combat action in New Guinea. So the first thing they were gonna do was, I'm sorry, target Rabal, and Rabal is in the red circle up towards the top of the chart there. Uh, that was the major Japanese staging base. It's on the island of New Britain. All right, so Rabaul, uh, there was a good natural harbor there, Simpson Harbor, and that needed to be negated, but there was also a number of airfields. The first attack that the 345th made was against Vunakanao Airfield. Uh, this, was a, this was the largest of the Japanese airfields that was in the area, and it was important that they took this airfield out. Their second big action was against the port facilities and the anti-aircraft fire or the anti-aircraft artillery that was in and around Simpson Harbor. And that was going to be an important mission. So I'll, I'll talk about them separately. All right, so the Vunakanao raid, uh, the pictures you see here, the one on the left, they've, uh, they were not one of the initial waves that came in. But as they're coming in, you can see there's already some damage going on and the parafragmentation bombs that I've circled, those are actually going to land on airplanes that were in the trees. They were camouflaged as best they could, and they were going to take those out. And then the other picture is a Betty bomber that's about to be destroyed by the uh, parafragmentation bombs. So this raid was successful, and they neutralized the airfield. 
The other part of it was the Simpson Harbor. So when you look at this slide, on the left-hand side, you can see the harbor with a lot of ships in it. And on the right-hand side, you see the white phosphorus bombs that have, dead, that have just blown up. Uh, they were taking out those anti-aircraft emplacements. Uh, and they were taking out a lot of the other structures in the area. But their other job was to provide camouflage or smoke. So they were a smoke screen so that the guns that did survive, they could not effectively shoot at the bombers that were going to come in from the other bomb groups to hit the fleet. And this, is what, this was the end result. Uh, these three Japanese ships that you see here, the front ship is a cruiser that would be damaged in the battle. It just hadn't been hit yet. Uh, the middle one was a freighter that was on fire and was going to sink. And then the third ship at the back is a, a small escort vessel that was also destroyed. And in the background, right in front of the mountain, between the water and the mountain, you can see the, uh, the smoke screen. And that was a result of those white phosphorus bombs that the 345th had dropped. Overall, this was an incredibly successful raid. Fifth Air Force claimed over 114,000 tons of Japanese shipping sunk and they destroyed over 300,000 tons of supplies that they would need. And those supplies would have gone to either New Guinea or to the uh, Japanese troops that were still fighting in the Solomon Islands. So this really neutralized Rabaul. All right, now flying out of Dobadura again, uh, they would support the marine invasion of Cape Gloucester. Gloucester is at the western end of New Britain, and this would be the next, next big combat action for the 345th. So Cape Gloucester, the Marines landed on December 26, 1943, and the 345th's primary job was to support that landing. And they actually went in right before the Marines went in. The picture on the left shows Marine landing craft in the water with 345th bombers flying towards the beach. All four squadrons participated in this raid. The 500th was the lead squadron in, and they dropped white phosphorus bombs. The rest of the squadrons came in dropping these general purpose bombs, and all four squadrons dropped bombs and made these passes. After that, they came back around. Each squadron made two strafing runs and then went back to their base. That was their morning action. Uh, in the afternoon, they came back to provide close air support for the Marines. Uh, the end state was the Marines were able to easily establish a foothold in Cape Gloucester. Now, the, the ground combat was pretty intense, and it went on for a while, but the 345th had done their job on the initial day, and they had a uh, help the Marines establish their foothold. All right, now their next action, and this was probably one of the most costly combat actions they had, was against Kavieng. So that's up at the top of the chart. It's at the northwestern tip of New Ireland. Now, this base had become the replacement for Rabaul as far as a staging base and a supply base. And so it was critical that we were going to take that base out next. So this is the shoreline along the base. And the area that I've got circled in red there was a, f a fuel dump there, and the first crews that came through for the 345th hit that fuel dump, and they caused massive fires, and that's what you're seeing in the smoke, is the smoke from those big fires. The problem with that f fires was as they were continued to burn, they would cause explosions, and it started to throw debris into the air, including 55-gallon drums of gasoline that were full. And there were multiple airplanes in the 345th that were hit by these drums, and they unfortunately crashed, and the crews were killed. Uh, that was how big these fires were. And remember, these guys are flying at 100 to 300 feet off the ground, so they, and they couldn't get away from these. They couldn't see them coming, so you couldn't maneuver away from them. So they did lose four crews that way from just debris in that, in that hailstorm or that, that big fire. Now, the other thing that happened is three crews did ditch in the water. And talk about that really quickly, well, hopefully quickly. Uh, so three crews did ditch in the water, and they were all recovered. Uh, two were recovered on the first day, and they were recovered by the PBY Catalina at Arkansas Traveler. Uh, this airplane was on rescue duty that day, and they had received a call that there was a downed crew. They went and landed, and on this particular day, the swells were eight to 10 feet. So this was, they were not smooth seas, and when that PBY hit the water, it hit the water so hard, and it actually was popping rivets on the airplane that started to take on water. Unfortunately, where they were told to go, and there was a life raft there, there were no air crew members there. So they got airborne again and were actually heading back to their, uh, their station to uh, wait to get called in when one of the B-25s from the 345th came along and got their attention. They couldn't get them on the radio, so they visually got them to follow them, and they realized there were three crews down in the water. They were far enough apart that he couldn't pick them all up at once. So 
the pilot, Nathan Gordon, he lands. The first crew got to the airplane, but they couldn't get in the airplane because the engines were still running, and it was slowly drifting away from him. So Gordon made the decision to shut down his engines. There was no guarantee they were going to start, but he shut them down anyway. They got those six crew members from the 345th in, started his engines, took off, went and landed the second time. Now, every time he's landing, he's taking in a little bit of water in his airplane. But he got that second 345th crew in, had to do the same thing, shut down the engines, restart them in these very rough seas. He took off and landed and picked up a third crew. They were from the 38th bomb group. There was three of them. They were flying an A-20. Uh, so there was only three guys in that airplane. And so he had 15 downed air crew members in his PBY in, in addition to his 10-person crew. So there's 25 people in this Catalina. They did get back safely to the base. For his actions that day, Nathan, was, Nathan Gordon was awarded the Medal of Honor, and he's the only PBY pilot to earn the Medal of Honor during World War II. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Gordon, there is a display underneath the right wing of the museum's PBY that talks about what he did that day. The last crew... Uh, they didn't get picked up the first day. They got picked up two days later. So fortunately for them, uh, one of the other crews in their squadron, when they were listening to the debrief, they realized where these guys had gone down. So they played a hunch. Uh, it was really a well-educated guess. And when they left Kavieng the next day and coming back to the base, they flew low over that area where they thought they had gone in. And sure enough, they saw these guys on the beach waving at them. And they actually, a couple of them jumped into a life raft and went out into the water they circled back, dropped some emergency supplies to them, and those guys went back to shore. But more importantly, when they got back to base, they went over and they told everybody where they were at, and then they, one of the pilots went out the next day in the PBY, in a different PBY than Arkansas Traveler, and they picked that crew up. So those three crews were recovered. But uh, it, was a, it was a costly raid. It cost, this, it cost the group seven airplanes and four air crew. All right, now they've moved to NADZAB. This will be their final location on New Guinea, and they're going to continue to hit WeWAC. We won't talk about that a whole lot, but then they're going to hit Hollandia, which was going to be the next big Allied amphibious assault that was going to take place. Uh, now, the group was going through some changes at this time frame. Uh, one of the biggest was that the initial cadre of crews were starting to rotate home. Uh, 50 missions was the magic marker for these guys to get rotated home, and a lot of crews were starting to get to 50 missions, so they were a lot of replacement crews, so they were training everybody up. In addition, the 498th Bomb Squadron was re-equipped with B25Hs. The H model is one of two variants that had the 75 millimeter cannon in the nose. And so up in the front there, and that's in that lower, the lower corner of the nose. It also had 450 caliber machine guns. Now, this cannon from 2,000 yards out, they could get three shots off before they had to go back and re-engage. Um, and it was a manually loaded cannon. The navigator actually loaded and fired the cannon. So all he was doing was just doing that action, and it just took time to get those shells loaded. The crews didn't really like it because it, it was not easy to use, and the maintenance guys really didn't like it because when they would come back, they had to replace rivets or sheet metal that was damaged by the cannon. So it was a very difficult thing to do. But this was, this was the brainchild of Pappy Gunn, and it's a really good idea. I just don't think it worked as well as they thought it would in reality. But H models were actually produced at the factory in Inglewood, California, and were sent into theater. So that was one of Gunn's other jobs, was he would go back and work with North America on modifying the airplanes in the production line, which was easier than doing it in the field. All right. Other things that they did to the airplane, they moved the top turret from behind the wing up to the leading edge of the wing. And you can't really see it, but they did improve the tail, gunner's, uh, the tail gunner position. I've got a picture that shows it a little bit better. Uh, that'll be later in the presentation. All right, very quickly about Hollandia. So Hollandia, they had to take out the air base. Uh, and that was really the primary focus of the 345th was taking out this Japanese air base. So 5th Air Force went to work, um, and the 345th was participating in this. Uh, in one week, the 5th Air Force destroyed over 400 Japanese airplanes, and most of it was using these low-level bombing tactics that they were using, including the, what the 345th was doing. This next picture is a 345th airplane making a low-level pass over the jungle. You can see the parafrags on the left corner of the picture, and in the right side, uh, right around the nose of the airplane where that red circle's at, that bright flash, that's the 50 caliber machine guns being fired. So they've already dropped their parafrags and now they're strafing Japanese positions. And this was 
as you can see, they are not that high above the trees, which is where that concept of the treetop terrors came from. All right, one of the dark things that happened during Hollandia was uh, Black Sunday, which was April 16th, 1944. So they took off to go fly their mission. They knew the weather was going to be a little iffy when they got back. It got very iffy to the point where they couldn't safely land at most of their operating bases. Uh, Fifth Air Force launched 200 airplanes that day. They lost 31 aircraft to weather. Uh, I think that their losses for the day were two to four airplanes total to combat and then 31 to weather. Uh, the 345th did lose two airplanes to weather, and one of the P-38 pilots in Fifth Air Force said that there were hundreds of GIs lining the runway watching Fifth Air Force destroy itself. Um, it was one of those moments that General Kenny would have liked to have back just because of the losses of air crew members, the 32 air crew members he lost, and then the uh, airplanes, which were in short supply, and it was really because of a decision that they made at the leadership level. All right, now they're on to Biak. So Biak is an island that's just off of New Guinea, um, and they would stop really doing a, a lot of operations in New Guinea, and they would start focusing on the island chain to the west. This was the Netherlands Indies. Uh, they were going to hit Japanese air bases. They were going to sink ships and uh, target supplies in that area. One of their most successful raids out of Biak was against this uh, supply facility, and it was in September of 1944. Uh, the supply facility had just been built. They just realized, the Americans just realized it was there. The Japanese had not put any air, air defenses around it. So the 345th came in with no protection on, or no uh, adversary on the ground, and they were able to bomb it. There, you can see a B-25 lining up on the left-hand picture, and it's getting ready to drop its bombs. And then the right-hand picture is the result of that raid. The 345th didn't lose any airplanes on that raid, but they did destroy the facility. All right, so continuing to fly out of Biak, now they were starting to hit the Philippines. So this was going to be the opening acts of General MacArthur's return to the Philippines. And one of their primary targets was going to be airfields. Uh, this is Boyan Airfield in uh, that same time frame where they were hitting the uh, Netherlands Indies. Uh, the picture on the left is a maintenance facility. Uh, you can't really see the building real well. You can start to see it, but there's a lot of smoke around it, and the building was destroyed. The other picture is a Francis bomber. Uh, that was a, essentially the Japanese equivalent to the B-25. Uh, that airplane was not destroyed on this raid, but I just put it in here to give you an idea of the extent that the Japanese would go to to camouflage their airplanes so it was harder for these air crew to see them when they were coming in at low level and high speed. All right, now they're actually moving into the Philippines. So starting in December of 1944, they were going to move to the island of Leyte, and it was Tacloban Air Base. So they're in the central part of the Philippines. And most of their operations were going to be in and around the Philippines with a lot of it on the island of Luzon. One of their biggest targets was Clark Field. Uh, this airfield had been an American airfield before the Japanese had invaded the Philippines had a lot of infrastructure, it was a well-developed field, but what the American concern at this point was the airplanes that were on the airfield. The Japanese had started using the kamikaze tactics, and so they were going to go ahead and try to take out as many airplanes as they could so the Japanese could not use the kamikaze tactics. Now, as we started to attack the airfield, we started with the B-24s, the high-altitude bombers, and their job was to go after the infrastructure, and they did a really good job at that. That building in the lower right-hand corner of this picture, that was one of the many hangars that was destroyed by the B-24s. So now it was the 5th Air Force's low-level attackers to come in and finish off the airplanes. So in this, you see the uh, parafrag bombs starting to fall, and they're going to take out airplanes that are scattered around the area. The other thing I want to show you is that puff of smoke that you see there in the circle. That is a white phosphorus bomb. That is not an American white phosphorus bomb. The Japanese had a tactic. They would fly about 1,500 feet above these low-level attackers. They would drop their own phosphorus bombs. They had about a seven-second delay on the fuse, and they would blow up about the altitude that we were flying at. Their thought was is if they timed it right, the phosphorus would fly out and hit the American airplanes, catch them on fire, and then the airplanes would burn and crash into the ground. Um, the American crews called them streamer bombs because if you look towards the outside of that white phosphorus that has streamers that come off of it. And so that's why they called them that. 
It was not an effective tactic, but the Japanese did try to do that throughout the war. Um, they were successful in destroying uh, the, Ap the Japanese airplanes, so it did limit the kamikaze threat in the Philippines. One of the other missions they did, which is not uh, as glamorous as this low-level bombing, is they dropped leaflets. This particular, pic this particular picture is a leaflet drop on the Bataan Peninsula, and they were trying to get Japanese soldiers to surrender. Um, as many of us know, the Japanese soldiers had a tendency to not surrender, but they did get a handful that did surrender. And what they found out from these guys as they started talking to them was that they knew who the 345th was. At this point in the Philippines, they had the Air Apache's logo on their airplane. And the Japanese, the ground troops feared that logo. They knew that when they saw that logo that the bad things were coming their way. So that was one of the things that got fed back to the 345th was the fact that these their airplanes were known and they were feared. So now where they're moving into the island of Luzon and they've got San Marcelino is the base that they're gonna operate out of. Uh, this was gonna be a temporary airfield for them to operate out of until they moved to Clark Field. So in this time frame between Biat or between uh, Tacloban and uh, San Marcelino, they started to get B-25Js. This is very similar to the museum's B-25J. You've got that greenhouse nose, that glass nose. There's 350 caliber machine guns in the nose of the airplane. Two are fixed, one's that flexible machine gun. They also had, on their versions, they had these blister packs on the outside. Those were those 50 caliber machine guns in their own individual turrets. You still had that top turret that they could spin around. This one's actually facing forward in this picture, so you can see it. Uh, they now have nine, mach nine machine guns that they could fire forward. And they also had, that's the tail gunner's position. So they put a little bit better, a little bit more room in there for the tail gunner and they could see what they were doing. Now, they had these airplanes in their inventory, but they also had the factory modified Js, the Dash 32 ver variant of the airplane. These came direct from the factory with the 850 caliber machine guns mounted on them. This gave them a lot of firepower. Now they did come from the factory with those side turrets on them, but what the crews found, the ground crews in particular, was they were really hard to maintain, and they decided to take them off. For some reason, they weren't as effective or as easy to work with as the ones that had been modified in the field. They just stripped them off, but between the 850 caliber machine guns in the nose and being able to swing that top turret around, they still had 10 machine guns they could fire at the enemy, so it was an effective ground attack airplane. And then you can see on this one, oh, looks like that arrow didn't want to play, but you can see that these don't have those blister turrets on the side. All right, now operating out of San Marcelino, they were going to start doing a lot of attacks against Formosa, or what we call Taiwan now, and they were also going to blockade the South China Sea. And this picture is a Japanese vessel, a freighter that's under attack right now. You can see in the water, the bullet strikes, and you can see that the bridge is already burning. So this, this, this ship would get sunk. All right, so now they have moved to Clark Field. So Clark Field has been repaired. They can operate out of it, and they're going to start operating in three different areas. You've got Indochina, or what we call Vietnam now, and the coastal areas along mainland China, and then Formosa again. There was some activity in Luzon, but we're not going to talk about that a lot. I'm mostly focused on those other areas. So their primary missions were to continue to hit the uh, Formosa, the Indochina area, and then blockade the uh, South China Sea. Uh, and they were, uh, they were supported the ground operations in Luzon, like I said. Uh, these, two, these two are uh, different pictures of ships under attack, a Japanese escort vessel, so an armed escort vessel. Uh, this one... You can see that there's some damage to it already and the, they would end up sinking this ship. The picture on the right is a, uh, a fuel freighter or a petroleum freighter that was actually caught in harbor and was blown up. So this is, I think, one of the most impressive sequences of pictures from that belly camera. And so that's one of the reasons I put it in. And this is a rail yard in uh, Indochina that they hit. So the first picture, you see where the bomb has impacted the building inside the red circle. The second picture, inside that red circle, you see that bright spot? They, they believe that there were at least one, probably more than one, rail cars filled with ammunition. That bomb hit that 
hit that one or more rail cars and caused a huge explosion. And if you look closely, you can see where the roof is starting to buckle up. The third picture is the roof is pretty much gone. And the last picture is the rest of the building is now gone. So, and these are, these are actually pretty good resolution on these pictures. That's one of the reasons I put it in. So you can see how effective these tactics could be. All right, now we're getting to Aishima. We're getting to the end of the war. This is the last really six to eight weeks of the war. All right, so Aishima is this tiny little island just off of Okinawa, like I said earlier, about 350 miles from Japan. Blow it up so you get some perspective on how big it is compared to, or how small it is compared to Okinawa. And then just their operation area is going to be in that red circle. And they were going to hit Korea and then mostly the southern part of Japan. Just for reference, there's Tokyo. It's the Japanese capital. Hiroshima, the site of the first atomic bombing. And Nagasaki, the site of the second atomic bombing. So we're very close to that time frame when it's going to happen. All right, so their initial operations, they were looking for ships. So they were out in the, uh, flying over the, the Sea of Japan and just looking for ships. Weather was bad, they couldn't fly safely at those altitudes, so they flew over Kyushu, which was the southernmost island in Japan, and they just hit targets of opportunity. On the 31st of July, which is the picture on the left, they hit a uh, nitrogen factory, destroyed it. And then on the 5th of August, there was a brief break in there between the 31st and the 5th. Um, that was due to a typhoon that came in. Uh, they guess they decided ty flying in a typhoon was not a good idea. Can't argue with them there. Uh, and then uh, the picture on the right is strikes by the 5th Air Force, including the 345th, against the area where the intelligence believed that the uh, rocket-propelled uh, suicide bomb aircraft were being built. So they took out that coastal region there and they devastated that area. Getting in the last couple days of combat, uh, by this point, the Japanese did not have a lot of ships. Uh, between our submarines and these aircraft blockades, we had destroyed most of the Japanese shipping in and around the country. So material was not moving to Japan. Uh, they really didn't find much, a few coastal freighters and some fishing vessels which they destroyed. On the evening of the 14th of August, Emperor Hirohito recorded a message that would be broadcast to the Japanese people announcing that the war was over. And that was broadcast on the 15th at noon in to Tokyo time. So on the morning of the 15th, the 498th and the 501st, the crews were in the briefing room. They were getting ready to go fly that day. And then they were told to stand down, the war is over. The 499th and the 500, they had already gotten airborne. They were recalled with an encoded message. It said, return to base immediately, hostilities have ceased. So the crews turned around, they came back in, and they landed safely. So now the, war, the combat is done, but now we've got to get to the, the official surrender of Japan. So the 345th played a role in this event. Uh, they escorted the Japanese uh, negotiation delegation to Aishima, where they were then boarded onto a Army Air Force C-54, so a large four-engine transport. They flew down to Manila, had the negotiations with General MacArthur and his staff. They came back to Aishima. Uh, both airplanes were supposed to leave on the 20th of August. Unfortunately, one of the, the Betty bombers, and you see it pictured here, they were painted white with green crosses on them to designate that they should not be shot. And those airplanes, uh, one of the airplanes went off the edge of the taxiway, damaged the wheel, so that Japanese crew had to spend an extra day uh, at Aishima, uh, then they d departed on the 21st. And as I'm doing, doing the research on this, the, uh, one of the things I found striking was there was a l multiple comments or stories in the two books, the couple books I used, where they talked about how it was so weird for the Americans and the Japanese both. They've been at war with each other for the last four years or so, and now all of a sudden they're standing in the same line at the chow hall waiting to get dinner. And it was just a strange you know, gone from a week prior, you're bombing these people, and now you're having lunch with them, essentially. All right, so the combat record for the 345th. Um, they participated in nine major campaigns. They flew over 10,600 combat sorties. Uh, they sank 260 Japanese vessels, damaged another 275. They destroyed 260 aircraft on the ground and got credit for 107 aerial kills. Uh, the unit won four distinguished unit citations, and then they also had losses of 712 total airmen. Uh, that included accidents, and of those 712, 580 were killed in combat. 
So after the war ends, the units decommissioned in December of 1945, was recommissioned in July of 1954. They flew B-50, the B-57 Canberras, which are pictured here, uh, and the 345th Bomb Group was con reconstituted with the same four squadrons, with the same nicknames, and they were the Air Apaches again. And then they were permanently decommissioned in 1959, and the uh, Air Force has not recommissioned the unit since. Uh, these are two of the books I used for uh, the presentation. Uh, Warpath Across the Pacific, a lot, of, a lot of pictures. A lot of the pictures came out of that book. Um, a lot of really detailed information on different sorties. Uh, you can look up all the aircraft that were assigned to the group by squadron, and you can get the uh, airplane's name, who the pilots were, and what the fate was of the airplane. Um, the other book, Air Apaches, is more of a narrative story, telling the story of the Air Apaches, but uh, tons of great information in both books. So that's going to end my book report on the two books. All right, so with that, do you guys have any questions? And I think, Bill, are you the only one with the microphone? I do. Hello, testing, testing. Yes, I do. Okay, so I think what we'll do for, pick, for questions, if you guys can wait for Bill to get to you. Reese, to Reese will be on the other oh, side. Oh, Reese has got the other side, okay. All right, we'll give Reese a second here. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I always wondered how come when we go to war, we don't take over the countries and turn them into America? Well, uh, Matt, you're, you're a historian, not a politician. Exactly. Thank you, sir. That's the answer I was going to give. <laughs> All right. Hang on just a second, sir. We'll get to you. How many crew members were there? How many crew members were there? Generally, there was six. Oh, yes. On each airplane. All right. So why don't you just holler it out and I'll repeat it for you. Okay, so the question was, when they're firing all the machine guns, did the airplane ever stall out? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. But uh, that's the best answer I can give you. I didn't find any documentation of that. They did say, the pilot said that when they were firing the cannons, the ones that had the cannons in the nose, that it felt like the airplane actually stopped every time one of the shells was firing. Okay, that's fair. Uh, what did the Japanese plan to accomplish by taking Australia? What did the Japanese want, or what was their purpose of taking over Australia? So one of the Japanese goals was to have more territory. Uh, in 1940, Japan, Japan was one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And so they wanted, to, uh, they wanted to have more space for their people to live. And they wanted to spread their culture throughout Asia. Hang on, Reese. Sure. Okay, thank first. you. I always wanted to add. Rappers, <laughs> no. Um, hey, I was test. I got one back here. Go ahead. Okay, so on the, uh, you talked about the parafrag. Yep. Uh, you didn't go into any detail on skip bombing. No, I didn't. So when I was doing my research for the 340. 345th specifically, I didn't find any references to skip bombing. Now, that was a tactic that they would use in theater, but I didn't see where it was the 345th. So to explain the crowd skip bombing, you fly low level over, say you've got a 500-pound bomb, it's on a delayed fuse, so the bomb won't blow up as soon as it contacts the water. And much like skipping a rock, which I think most of us have probably done when we were kids, um, my inner 12-year-old still likes to do it, um, when you come in, you drop the bomb, and the airplane flies away, and the bomb will skip two to three times and impact the ship. And hopefully you've timed it correctly to where about the time you hit the ship or very close to it, the bomb will blow up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was a delayed fuse. Uh, th thank you. Hey, I was wondering in terms of the uh the B-25's introduction into World War II and its importance, 
uh, if you would want to make any mention of these 16 Check one, two, B-25s three, and their crews three, that three, took three, off on the one, USS three, Hornet three, early on, April 1942, out. on their Doolittle right, Raid. Yeah. So I didn't, for the purposes of today's presentation, just given the fact that we are trying to focus very much on the Air Apaches, but yes, that was an important part of the B-25 story, and it's probably what it's most famous for is the Doolittle Raid. Anybody else got questions? One over here. Hey, Bill, Bill, we got somebody underneath okay. over by the airplane. Oh, uh, no, we can't let him talk. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we got another one. Yeah, hi. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Two, quick question. Uh, where were the B-25 pilots trained? Uh, as far as specifically for the B-25? Correct. Uh, Bill, do you know? Because I'm not sure off the top of my head. Right yeah, I was Carolina. wondering if that was down in Fort Worth. <laughs> I'm not positive. I'd have to go look that up. I think one of your earlier slides said South Carolina. So that was, that was the, where the, the group trained? Yeah. So that, but I don't know if those guys if they did like a schoolhouse specifically for the B-25 and then went to the unit to do their training there. I'm not sure how they handled that. They yeah. didn't really discuss that in the books that I was using for uh, research on this one. My question is, uh, did Kenny and Gunn stay with those units throughout the uh, rest of the war? It, they did. Now, Gunn did go back to the States for a while. He was working with North American to redesign the airplane to put the different the cannons and the machine guns in. Gunn did go back to Fifth Air Force um, and he was actually wounded in the Philippines and then was sent back stateside. He never was uh, returned to the theater. But General Kenny did stay with the 5th Air Force throughout the war. Uh, was anything like this used, like the invasion at Normandy, where you could come in before the troops landed and strafe the machine guns and then play it, you know, things I, there? I don't think that 8th Air Force really used these low-level tactics. They tended to use the medium bombing tactics. Now, they did, they did support the landings but uh, I don't believe that they were bombing on the day of the invasion. Hang on, He'll, Bill's gonna bring the microphone over. Why didn't the U.S. take the Philippines? You know, it, it got annexed. Why, why didn't we what? Why didn't we take the Philippines? Uh, as far as, because when the Japanese took the Philippines, so we just weren't strong enough to take the Philippines back when the Japanese invaded. Right, so, yep, okay. So, yeah, so they, we weren't strong enough to take it back right away. It took a long time to build up to that. And that was, and I know there was a lot of debates. Uh, a lot of the leadership did not want to go back to the Philippines, but MacArthur, MacArthur stuck to his guns because he had promised the Filipino people he was going to come back. So that was why they ended up taking the Philippines. It just took longer than most people wanted it to. Uh, the only uh, time that I knew about this aircraft flying off aircraft carriers was the Doolittle Raid. What, can you explain uh, why there are so many carrier takeoffs listed on the side of the airplane? There? I'm going to let Bill explain that because he's the one that did it. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> So uh, we started in uh, 1992. We kind of went to the Navy and asked them if we could borrow an aircraft carrier to honor the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. And we were pretty well shocked when they came back and said, if you can insure a carrier, we'll let you fly off. We found out that Lloyd's of London will insure anybody. <laughs> so we were able to fly this B-25 off and then Subsequently, we took, uh, took it and 12 other, well, 12 airplanes total to Hawaii in 1995, and we did the end of World War II commemorations where we flew 11 of those aircraft off, including this plane. We did it again that same year in Alameda, um, and then we did it twice for the movie Pearl Harbor, which had a big part of, you know, the movie was about uh, the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. So we did it once off of the Constellation, and then we did uh, the Lexington. Lexington was the hardest because it wasn't under, it was a moored carrier. It's a museum in Corpus Christi Bay. So 
Disney asked if we could do it, and we asked them how much money they had, and they definitely had more money than we had brains. <laughs> how big was the to how big was the B twenty nine? How big was the B twenty nine? So I know it was ninety nine feet long. I can't remember what the wingspan is. It's over I think over one hundred and thirty feet for the B twenty nine, which has two more engines than this airplane does. Does that answer your question? Thank you. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> okay, Matt. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, the B-25 was one of the most versatile me medium bombers of World War II. So the airplane was used in almost every theater of war. Um, in this application that you're going to see today with the Air Apaches, it was very critical to have this airplane because instead of using high altitude bombing, they went to do in low altitude bombing because that's what the theater of war required. And so the airplane was very versatile. It could fly at 300 feet, 200 feet, be able to drop bombs. Uh, they put in eight gun nose in the, in the uh, where we have the bombardier's nose up here, and they would be able to use those for strafing. So they would get line abreast and they could get 10 airplanes come up and over a hill and then just start shooting, and it was like the jolly green giant of today. Well, this is uh, 4429199, which is the serial number. So the first two numbers tells you the year that it was built, which was 1944. The airplane was used in the United States. It never went into the theater of war. It was a trainer for multi-engine airplanes. Um, and the airplane, uh, this particular airplane, was converted to a TB-25N, which is what it is designated as now, which became a trainer bomber. So after the war, it flew with the Air Guard. It flew with every kind of different place, just so they could do training just about everywhere. Then it became a fire bomber. I think they flew it out of Arizona for about three years. Um, and then it was converted back to civilian. And it's probably, as far as I know, the highest time B-25 flying in the world today.